I'm an Orthodox rabbi. We believe that the Hebrew Bible alone is divinely inspired and is absolutely trustworthy. And therefore, it is these texts that we look to to say, what does God say about his nature? What does the Almighty share? And all you do is look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. You know, these are the first words that a, a little Jewish boy, a little Jewish girl learn. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Why don't we have a clear text anywhere in the Hebrew Bible that gives us the Nicene Creed, the very clear statement of a triune doctrine? It's found nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. Our salvation depends on worshiping God in truth. Truth, and therefore, let's look at the Bible itself. That's a fair question. Bill, how would you respond to that? It seems to me, uh, you know, we're, it, it comes down to the question of, is the New Testament trustworthy? Does it contradict, though, what the Old Testament is saying? I think that's exactly right, Lee. We're coming at this question from two different sets of scripture or uh, wholly inspired writings. And I would agree with Tobia that if you approach this question simply on the basis of the Hebrew Bible or what we would call the Old Testament, one wouldn't come to believe that God is a trinity. The Messiah, have made it clear, is not God. He has to fear God. Why would the Bible say that God is not a man, yet uh, Bill is saying, yet the, the church is saying, the Pope wants you to know that he is a man. Why would the Bible say that at the end of days in Jeremiah 16, that the Gentiles, that means you, Lee, and you, Craig, are going to be coming to the children of Israel and say, you know, teach us about God. We have inherited lies and vanity. Well, the answer is that you guys need to get on with the radical monotheism, know that there is God alone. There is no progressive revelation when it comes to commandments. All 613 commandments are clearly in the Torah. A progressive revelation could be about information that's not necessary for salvation, like the resurrection of the dead. Question one is about regarding progressive revelation. Does Deuteronomy 13 absolutely uh, refute any kind of idea of progressive revelation, especially as it concerns uh, the Christian uh, understanding of how God revealed things to humanity. Thank you. Oh, cool. Okay, mm. right on. All right, take it away, boss. It's all yours. It's a very good question. Progressive relation is an instrument that Christians use to explain away why the church has core tenets that are completely opposed by the Jewish scriptures and certainly found nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. This presents a very big problem for Christians, but not for Hindus. Hindus don't believe in the Jewish Bible, so therefore they don't look at it as scripture, and therefore anything that Hindus do that does not comport with Tanakh is not a problem. But it's a massive problem for the church. I'm going to speak about the most serious self-inflicted wound of Christendom. It's doctrine of the Trinity, a core tenant that was developed in in the second century, the word was coined at the time, and became a firm part of Orthodox, lowercase o, Christian teachings by the fourth century at the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople in 325 and 381, respectively. The problem is that there is nothing remotely like the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, anywhere in Tanakh. In Tanakh, we are told that there is no one else. Ato hares ladas, you have been shown this, so you may know, ki Hashem hu elakim, for the Lord is God, ein oid mulvado, there is no one besides him. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. We are repeatedly told, remember, you saw no image. So the Greek Orthodox that are out there, the children of Israel were reminded, Remember, when you were in the mountain, you only heard the voice of Hashem. Now, the problem is, how do you explain away that there's a doctrine of the Trinity? Isaiah didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. He didn't worship three persons and one God. Nothing about the doctrine of the Trinity maps on to the Jewish scriptures. As it turns out, I debated a, a I think one of the one of the best Christian apologists uh, years ago on live television, actually on a Christian station. When I raised this point, why is this concept nowhere found in the Jewish scriptures? And he conceded that it wasn't. He's an honest man, he's a good man, very, a very bright Christian apologist. He replied that this is a progressive revelation. 
And what he means is just as it sounds, that we slowly have a new revelation. It's true he conceded the doctrine of the Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Jewish scriptures, nowhere in Tanakh. As it turns out, when Christians scour the Hebrew Bible and they look for words that can be construed to reflect some plurality, they ignore all the very clear texts. Be very careful with the soul. He didn't say any image when you were at Mount Sinai. There is no other God. There is nothing like me. As it turns out, the doctrine of the Trinity does not fit with Tanakh, and it's opposed by Tanakh. You must say that God slowly, or over time, 1,300 years later, revealed the doctrine of the Trinity. And it concedes that this is not found anywhere in the Jewish scriptures. No Jew would have believed in the doctrine of the Trinity. Moses, neither his disciples, no one believed in the doctrine of the Trinity. So they were saving it for much, much later. Now, as it turns out, for a wide range of reasons, this is impossible. It's impossible because, as it turns out, we are told that the very security of the children of Israel depended on their truthful worship, the proper worship of God. This is how the Ten Commandments begins. It doesn't begin with bear false witness. It doesn't begin with Shabbos. It begins, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. He based Avodim from the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods upon my face. Don't add any god to me. Exodus chapter 20. Therefore, the Jews would have to know from the get-go, immediately, we would have to know exactly what it is that we're worshiping. As it turns out, we were told immediately, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, blessed memory, Ruato, see now, Ke'ani, I am, Ani who, I am the one. Ve'ain Elohim imadi, there is no other God with me. There is no other divine presence besides me. What was my Rabbeinu trying to convey over? There's nothing besides the Almighty. Number two is, the Torah says, be careful, you cannot add to the Torah nor take away from it. See Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. That means you can't add to it. You can't take away from it. Moreover, the Torah itself warns us something else. This is very important. And we see this throughout the prophets. And that is, don't worship anything new. If you are being enticed into worshiping a deity that neither you nor your fathers know, don't follow it. In fact, we are told, and this is what the caller is speaking about. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 7. If your brother meaning the son of your mother. Why does the Torah say the son of your mother, not the son of your father? Because only the son of your mother would be achicha. Only the son of your mother would be a fellow Jew. If the person has a Jewish father and not a Jewish mother, he's not Jewish. The Torah is making it clear a Jew is the one whose mother is Jewish. It could be anyone within your midst. What is the message? This is the Torah warns you about. Neolcha, let's go. And we'll worship other gods. Asher lo yadato. You didn't know, neither you nor your fathers knew. The Torah is saying, if what is being presented to you, something you're not aware of, is that a, and your fathers didn't know it, don't follow it. So therefore, there's no room for progressive revelation. It means the Almighty, blessed be His holy name, is putting inside the text, warning, this is it, there is nothing else. And that's why progressive revelation, while it does successfully explain away any false religion, it is thoroughly opposed by the Jewish scriptures. As for the texts, uh, when the texts are looked at more carefully, we see that in the Old Testament, there is no text that indicates that God has an eternally begotten Son. In fact, uh, David was even talking about the Holy Spirit and saying the Father and the Holy Spirit as though these are two separate persons. But as James Charlesworth has mentioned in another book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was never in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as a, as a separate uh, person uh, from the Divine uh, Father. Uh, so you didn't have like God and Holy Spirit as two, and then we're waiting for the third to be revealed. Uh, we, we had just simply one God, and the Holy Spirit was spoken of, of like as the power of God that influences actions 
in the world or persons who will act uh, in the world in a particular way. So again, we're seeing a developed doctrine and the texts uh, of, the, of the Bible do not actually support this. For the New Testament to be true, it has to agree with the old. As uh, James White said in, the, in his book, The God Who Justifies, there is only one God. And the God of the New Testament is identical to the God of the old in, in every way. So you cannot have a new God in the New Testament. You have to have the same old one uh, God. Jonathan argues that the disciples were uh, Trinitarian. And... Uh, uh, he, he cites the Quran uh, to say that uh, the disciples are in good standing in the, in the Quranic language because they said, uh, uh, bear witness that we are the helpers of God and we are Muslimun, we are Muslims. So how can we avoid the fact that the disciples are, are shown to be good in the Quran and we know from history that the disciples were Trinitarian? Well, the fact of the matter is that we know from history that the disciples were not Trinitarian. We know that the doctrine of the Trinity took a couple of hundred years to develop. Uh, Christians got together in the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 and at that time they ruled that uh, Jesus is very God of very God and they said we also believe in the Holy Spirit but they did not say anything about the Holy Spirit being God or that the Holy Spirit should be worshipped. They had to come back uh, at, in the Council of Constantinople in 381 and that is when they ruled that the Holy Spirit should also be worshipped along with God the Father and the Son. So that shows a development in the doctrine. If you go back even earlier to the Apostles Creed which is from the second century, it doesn't even say the sun is to be worshipped. So now we have three creeds, the Apostles' Creed, second century, uh, Council of Nicaea, early fourth century, uh, Council of Constantinople, late uh, fourth century. So if you see the development, only one God here, Apostles' Creed, second century, only the Father is God. Second uh, uh, of these we have in the Council of Nicaea, for early fourth century, now the sun is also God. Now we have two. Uh, later in that century, Constantinople, now the Holy Spirit is also God, now we have three. So it goes from one to two to three. It goes from Unitarian to Binitarian to Trinitarian. And uh, still, I say Trinitarian with some qualification because the idea that the, how these three can still be one, that uh, this took more time to be worked out. That does not mean that some of the earlier church fathers did not have some inkling of this. Yes, there is development. I've already seen, I've shown that this development started even with the Gospel according to John, and even before the Gospel according to John. Yes, even in the Gospel according to Mark, as I will detail now in response to Jonathan. Uh, so there's a development, starting out with uh, Jesus being preached as uh, the Son of God, in, in a metaphorical sense, just as I may say Jonathan is my son, uh, or uh, Peter says Mark is my son, uh, in, in, the, in, in the New Testament. It means metaphorical, not real son, but I have compassion, I love him, I respect him. Then later on, Jesus becomes literally the son of God. He becomes now uh, the only begotten son. And then later on, he becomes God himself, not just the son of God, but God the son. So it goes from metaphorical son to even adopted son, which I didn't mention earlier. That's with God declaring he's my son. So that's adoption. And then it becomes literally son, only begotten, and then God the son. So you see there's a development. 